Good, at, <clears throat> good afternoon. Welcome to SCA's webinar with Dr. Michael Perch. Michael will be speaking on subsurface machine learning introduction to spatial data analytics with Python. Uh, before we start today's webinar, we would like to ask some polling questions. So let me launch the first question and ask you how many years of full-time experience do you have in the oil and gas industry? So responses are coming in now. Looks like we have a pretty good distribution of different experience levels. About half of you have voted and it looks like we have some in every category so far. So uh, thanks for sharing your experience level. Still getting people signing in, so the answers are continuing to come in. But we've got 70%, so I'll go ahead and close this poll and share the results. So uh, we're seeing the majority are in the one to 10 year level of experience, followed closely by 11 to 20 and less than one year. So great distribution. Let me hide that one and we will go to question number two in our polling. And I would like to know how many years of experience do you have with Python? So let's see what we get here. I have a different spectrum here. Most of you are in the less than three year or the zero years of experience with Python. So that's uh, interesting. So far, no one has more than 10 years with Python. No one has five to 10 years. Everyone is five years or less. No surprise. Okay, so we've gotten about 75% of the responses. So let me close and share those results. Looks like we've got a group of people, 44% have no experience with Python and the rest of you are in the less than 10 year category. So then let's ask one last question. What is your primary discipline? So uh, we'll see what sort of responses we get. Quite a few in geoscience. Say so the vast majority in geoscience. And we're getting some in every other category, petroleum engineering, reservoir engineering, petrophysics, and the other. Okay. So most have voted there. So let me go ahead and share those responses with you real quickly. It looks like 62% of you are geoscientists and a, um, some distribution in each of the other categories. Great. So let me make sure I'm sharing my desktop and I would like to introduce Dr. Perch. Here we go. So uh, our speaker today is Dr. Michael Perch and he'll be speaking about subsurface machine learning introduction to spatial data analytics with Python. And uh, Dr. Perch is a Associate Professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering at the University of Texas, Austin. He also works in the Bureau of Economic Geology in the Jackson School of Geosciences at UT Austin and has many responsibilities in those roles. Um, Michael and I worked together at Chevron before he came to UT. He was in Chevron's energy technology company and has written over 45 peer-reviewed publications and other uh, resources that you'll see listed there. Uh, Dr. Perch teaches the following course for FCA, Introduction to Subsurface Machine Learning with Python. And here's a description of that class. It's offered actually next month in July in our new live online format. This will be offered three mornings, uh, Austin time from eight to noon. So calculate that in your time zone. If you plan to join, it will be delivered virtually. So for those of you who have travel restricted during times of COVID-19, you'll find this particularly convenient. And uh, here's some more information about this course and our contact information. You can contact us at training at seacompanies.com or of course by phone. 
uh, if you would like to have this course brought in-house, uh, we can discuss that with you as well. And future webinars that are on our calendar upcoming are listed here. Uh, next week, we have Dr. Mohan Kelkar, uh, recently retired from the University of Tulsa as department chair. We'll be talking about upscaling for efficient flow simulation with Petrel and opportunities for consulting in that regard. And then uh, Dr. Perch's colleague, Dr. Foster, will be speaking in mid-July in a companion webinar, Energy Data Science in Python, Introduction to Pandas. So we're looking forward to that as well. And just remember, SCA uh, is your source for technical training in engineering and geoscience, consulting, direct hire resources, and projects and studies. And without further ado, I'm going to pass the baton to Dr. Perch and um, Michael. Take it away. Awesome. Susan, thank you very much for the introduction. I appreciate that. I do believe right now I am sharing my screen and my video. Is that correct? That's great. Awesome. Yeah. Excellent. I appreciate that. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about subsurface machine learning. Really, it's a broad topic. There's a lot we should cover, but I think fundamental prerequisites that we should get into and something kind of small we could bite onto for this short time we have together today would be around this concept of spatial data analytics. And I throw in with Python. We're doing a lot in Python nowadays. I'll show you how easy it is to get the job done in Python. So I think this will be a lot of fun. What is my motivation to do this? Well, if we're gonna be developing data analytics and machine learning workflows, we must integrate the spatial context. In fact, I'll say it now and I'll probably say it again in the next hour, we are different. Our context is different than many other areas in which machine learning are being is being applied right now. And part of that is the spatial context. Now, as Susan mentioned, my former colleague from Chevron, happy to work with you again, Susan. If you're interested to learn more, we do have this four half day virtual training opportunity, which was already mentioned. So what's my agenda? What I'm going to do here over the next uh, about 53 minutes, I'll have an introduction. Now the introduction will just kind of explain who I am and kind of why I talk like I do. It'll help us communicate. And then I'll give a little bit about my philosophy. I'll even be honest and tell you about my biases so you'll know where I'm coming from. We're gonna then review a simple example to prove to ourselves that spatial context matters. There's so much more we could do with space, but I thought this was a nice short one we could show. We'll review a fundamental concept of stationarity. Part of my job when I teach is to give you terminology you can use at dinner parties to sound cool. And I think stationarity definitely falls into that. Sounds very cool to say. Hope it's not too esoteric. Quantifying spatial connectivity. We'll talk about the mechanism to do that through the Veragram. And then we'll demonstrate hands-on, how do you do Veragram calculation in Python? Now, the fun of that, what's really cool is I'll say it now, I'll say it again, is that one of the best ways to learn data analytics and machine learning is to play with the machines, play with the algorithms, and these interactive demonstrations allow us to do that. And this is something we incorporate within our teaching all the time. Now, after we do that, we've got to do something with the Veragram. We don't add value if we just calculate the Veragram, we're done with it. And one of the most common applications we have in the spatial context of, say, oil and gas, is pre-drill prediction. And that's important to optimize the next well location. It's important to work out uncertainty models and to figure out the economics of a brand new well package. And so I demonstrate a very simple interactive pre-drill ex pre exercise. So we'll go through all of that. So first of all, introduction, my philosophy. So first of all, if we haven't met each other before, and um, as Susan said, it's perch, it's just perch. In fact, if you pronounce it just like this, like the fish, you've got it, you nailed it. I have um, practical experience, about 13 years in Chevron, 17 years in experience in total, consulting, teaching, um, industrial R&D in the area of statistical modeling, modeling, subsurface modeling, geostatistics, uncertainty characterization, and so forth. I'm very flexible, so as we go through this, it's not gonna be really interactive, but if we were in class together, you could mute me. You could in fact say, well, this isn't working, speed it up, or we would really like to cover this topic. Chances are I have content on it. I've been known to 
go in that direction. I will listen to and be redirected by the the group if we need to. So also I'm an engineer and a geoscientist. I'm jointly appointed in the Cockrell School of Engineering and the Jackson School of Geosciences. So I do speak both languages. I'm working hard to support professional development. As a professor, I believe I have a responsibility to support our professional um, colleagues. And so I am committed to share every one of my university lectures online on my YouTube channel. Anyone can tune in and many, many well worked out examples in Python, R and even Excel. I even demonstrate a lot of things in Excel. I meet people where they are. I'm all about professional development and supporting our working people in the digital challenge that we're all facing right now. I teach and conduct research on subsurface data analytics and machine learning. I have a group of 12 PhD students. And like every professor, everywhere I go, I have my hat in my hand. And I am, if you work for a company and you're interested in supporting student research, come talk to me. Now let's get into philosophy around this. So first of all, if you feel like it's kind of like something weird has happened recently, that all this digital talk is going on in your organization, you're not alone. Every single company is facing this current digital challenge right now. It's happening all sectors of our economy. In fact, the Deloitte recent study in 2019, looking across different sectors of the economy, ranked each one of the sectors in general on their maturity, the readiness for digital technology. And what they found was that energy was somewhere in the middle and telecom and tech and media and so forth were kind of on the high side and life sciences and medical and so forth was on the low side. So in general, what we see is we're not on the tail, we're not the leading edge and we're not the trailing edge. We're in there, we're working forward. And every company, I, I taught I think 20 different companies last year, um, every company that I visit with is working right now to use digital tech technologies to add value. So there's a lot of emphasis and focus on this right now, for sure. Now, what are my biases? I get asked all the time to speak on panels. And, and for example, this was PricewaterhouseCoopers back in 2019 in April. I sat up with a panel of experts and talked to a bunch of VPs in our industry about what they should expect, what are the opportunities. And this is what I said, and I'll say this over and over again, there are opportunities to teach data analytics, machine learning methods to engineers and geoscientists to improve their capabilities. But geoscience and engineering knowledge and expertise remains core to our business. And that's been my perspective and my experience is that domain expertise really matters. Now, there is a role for the data scientist and I'm really, really excited. Every company I go to, I'm now seeing the data scientists. And so we know from the Venn diagram that they use that they're the intersection of some degree of domain expertise or knowledge, statistics, data analytics, which I'll argue are very much the same thing, and coding, or we like to say hacking, this idea of getting the job done, automation, um, being able to build workflows quickly and so forth, very efficient coding. And that intersection is the data scientists. Clearly, we can see great value in that. Now, what I would suggest is while we need data scientists, when I think about the engineers and geoscientists, I adjust the Venn diagram. What I say is that we, as educators, and this is something I'm doing a lot of at UT, Austin, we can graduate geoscientists and engineers with enhanced capabilities in data analytics and machine learning. I teach three courses to do that. They fill up very quickly. There's a lot of interest in doing that, and we're doing that right now in UT. Also, we can support the building of capability in existing geoscience and engineering workforce. I've taught a lot of engineers and geoscientists fundamental concepts all the way up to machine learning and more advanced machine learning methods like neural nets. And I found a high degree, in my opinion, high degree of success in these people with a level of interest and in being able to adapt and learn new capabilities. And I think this is very exciting. This will add value in our industry. Now, once again, if you are interested in the full course, because we're just taking a little bite size here today, we have the full four-day course this is the agenda laid out here you can see we go from fundamental prerequisites up to fun, um, basic probability bayesian and frequency probability data analytics data preparation feature engineering feature selection we, we cover also spatial models spatial simulation uncertainty modeling which are also cr critical 
and get into inferential approaches in machine learning like dimensionality reduction and clustering, various types of clustering and machine learning, and move into prediction models from simple hyperparameter based methods like K nearest neighbors up to artificial neural nets. Okay, so we're, we move our way through and cover a lot of these fundamentals. Now, what we'll do now is let's cover a small part of the class and provide useful, I think, a piece of useful theory and practice that you can use to add value in work. I like to say what we teach you today is something that you should be able to use this afternoon or tomorrow to add value at work. Okay, let's first of all all agree on the importance of spatial continuity. What is the impact of spatial continuity? And so I like to show my students this very simple example. It really is simple. It's a two-dimensional reservoir. It's 1,000 meters by 1,000 meters. As shown here, we have an injector. It's a five spot with an injector in the center. It's a water flood. Producers located right here, okay? I use the same porosity and permeability distributions you can see the ranges, I promise you they will not change and I will only show you permeability for a brevity of the display, okay? So here they are right here and I ask the question to my students, I say, does spatial continuity matter? And then I ask other questions. Do you like to see good spatial continuity? What is good spatial continuity? Do you want long spatial continuity? What does spatial continuity mean? And so this idea of a correlation over distance, do we want models that have no spatial continuity? This would be very poor spatial continuity or a model that has a moderate degree of spatial continuity. Over some degree of distance, we have predictability. From here, from the well to here, we know something about what's going on. Now recall, I keep all of the distributions the same. These are permeabilities and they're exactly the same distributions. This just doesn't have spatial continuity. And what's interesting is we can go ahead and subject this to flow. Now, I use the very simple methodology. This is just a fast marching approach. It will be earliest arrival. It's not the full physics. It's more of a permeability weighted distance, but it's still a very nice indicator. We can look at time of flight. That's what comes from it. We can see the time in order to reach different locations from the injector towards the producers. And immediately we can observe that the poor spatial continuity, the no spatial continuity actually would outperform when it comes to most metrics like recovery factor or the amount of the uh, overall water cut and so forth. And we'd see that in this case here, we have a lot of bypassed oil, we're getting a lower recovery. And so clearly spatial continuity matters. And I can ask the students, well, what happens if we increase the spatial continuity even larger? And now you can see it starts to become a problem we start to reach a point where we might be having early breakthrough at one well, we might not be even sweeping to these other producers and so forth, recovery is following. What if we have a high degree of anastropy in the permeability spatial continuity? We have preferred directions of spatial continuity like this and poor spatial continuity in this direction. And now we have a similar situation with potential for early breakthrough at this location, and we're not sweeping to these other producers. So recovery is following, falling even worse. So we've gone through a variety of examples to motivate or to investigate the importance of spatial continuity from very short or no spatial continuity to medium spatial continuity and to long range spatial continuity and anastropic. What we can see is that given the same distributions, it really does matter, spatial continuity does matter. And so we need to be able to characterize and quantify spatial continuity. And then we need to be able to take that quantification and impose it in our reservoir models. Now, for the purpose of machine learning, we could go a step further and say, we need to impose spatial continuity into our machines, into the feature engineering that supplies the information into those machines, into the uncertainty models. I could go on and on and on about how spatial continuity needs to be used in data analytics, machine learning, or traditional geostatistical reservoir modeling. Now, I've said spatial continuity, I think I probably got to about 40 or 50 times, so I should define it. And so spatial continuity would simply be correlation between values over a distance. From here to here, there's a correlation. And we would know some extreme members, no spatial continuity, like the one permeability field I showed on the left, would be no correlation between values over a distance. In other words, they're just random values. 
knowing something about this location tells me nothing about what's going on at an adjacent location, offset location. Homogeneous phenomenon are interesting. If you think about it, they are constant at all locations. They would have perfect spatial continuity and they would also not have uncertainty after the first sample. They would be something that would have perfect correlation across locations, just to understand these n members of spatial continuity. Now let's review an important concept. Before we can calculate together spatial continuity, we need to understand stationarity. Without a decision of stationarity, for data analytics, machine learning, geostatistics, we always make this decision in space. Without a decision of spatial stationarity, we cannot calculate any statistic nor build any spatial model. Okay, so we always, we can't escape it. This is inescapable. What is stationarity? Well, any statistic is going to require replicates. You cannot calculate a mean from one sample. You cannot calculate a variance or kurtosis, the 13th percentile. You can't calculate anything, any statistic without replicates. So we need repeated samples. And it makes sense in many applications like air or water quality sampling. You go to that monitoring station today, you take a sample, you come back, take a sample, and you can keep taking samples. You can build up distributions, calculate statistics, start to model. Now, the problem for us is we go to the subsurface and we extract a core sample. And that core sample could have a porosity of 13% or something like that. And then we go back to the same location later on. What do we find? we find a hole in the ground. There's nothing, the porosity is, and many students will pick up on this and say, well, 100% porosity, and you're right, it's just a hole. Now, what's the problem? We can't do replicates over time. So instead, we must pool samples over space to calculate any one of our statistics for our predictive models. The decision to pool data together and to use them to build a model is the decision of stationarity. It's the decision that a subset, a volume of the subsurface is all the same stuff. Now, there's really two parts of this. There are there, there is an import license and an export license to the decision of stationarity. The import license is a decision, what data can you pull together to make your statistic? But once you have a statistic, you have to make the decision of where can you use that statistic? Now, I asked some of my students recently, I said, well, what's the most extreme case of using statistics from one, one location going somewhere else in the world? And they realized immediately, oh, crops. Often we'll use examples from South Africa, the Karut, in order to inform what's going on in the Gulf of Mexico, or maybe from the Ross Formation, depending on the architecture that we detect. The export license is the choice of where you can use the statistics, and we just have to, we have to defend that using our best technical knowledge. Now, the geologic definition of stationarity could be spoken like this, and you can all test me on whether or not I'm a geoscientist. I wrote this. The rock is stationary over the domain as it is source deposited, preserved, and post-depositionally altered in a similar manner. The domain is mappable and may be used for local prediction or as information for analogous locations in the subsurface. Therefore, it is useful to pull the information and, uh, that is expertly mapped over this expertly mapped volume of the subsurface. So this idea, it's the same stuff. Of course, it means that the rock, its source, its provenance, it's the post-depositional diagenesis, and so forth, its history are all similar enough that we would expect the same type of rock. Now, the statistical definition of stationarity is a little more dry, but I think it's very useful. I noticed on the uh, discipline uh, multi multiple choice, there was no option for statistician, so I'll be very brief about this. It means the metric of interest is invariant under translation over the domain. Now, it's not so bad. Once again, this will sound cool at a dinner party. An example of this would be a stationary mean would mean that the expected value, which is a probability weighted average, we'll get into that in the course, of a certain property measured over a space is equal to a mean. A constant mean, it doesn't change. It's invariant under translation. The distribution shown as a capital F is the CDF, the cumulative distribution function for Z, feature Z, over locations U is only a function of 
feature Z. In other words, it's independent of location. And when we get into the bear ground, the same thing. It means we can remove location. The statistic is constant over the area. For stationarity, we always ask the question, what metric over what volume can we say it's stationary? And it could be any statistic. I know it's not abstract. It could be the facies proportions, which directly constrain the oil in place. It could be the permeability variance, which directly constrains the Dijkstra Parsons and heterogeneity measures. So this is not abstract by any means at all. Now, every single time you see a distribution, I challenge you to question or to ask about the decision of stationarity used to make that distribution. Okay, now let's just make sure we're all on the same page as far as stationarity goes. Now, I wish there was interactivity. I would ask if anybody recognizes this wall, and then I would immediately ask is, did anyone come from the Jackson School of Geosciences at the University of Texas at Austin? And if you did, you might recognize this wall. And if you didn't, I would tell you it was because you worked so hard that you didn't have time to sit outside of the building, drinking a coffee and staring at the wall across the plaza from you because that's the wall right there, okay? So I walked up to that wall, I took a picture of it and I could ask you, is this image stationary? Now, what most people would do is they look at it and they go, well, uh, and they think, and then something would happen they would cue into or key into a certain feature. And often it's the class. People look at these classes. If you look up close, they're bivalves. Or maybe it would be the brick shape. And then they would say, well, you know, it doesn't transition. It seems, well, it's kind of more class here, less class here, more class here. But universally, it doesn't seem to trend. It just kind of changes a little bit. I would agree with you if your intuition was to say that this is stationary. Well, let's zoom in. Now we zoom in. Now look, we have class here, no class here, no class here really, we're losing the density of them, or maybe they're smaller. Well, we could suggest that we are observing non-stationarities now, that we have systematic change or trends across here over the scales that we're observing now. Now we could go ahead and zoom in again. Don't look at that right there, just look at the rest of the brick, and now ask yourself if that's stationary. And I think what you'll observe is that for any metric you can think of, uh, ignoring the mortar, this is looking pretty, pretty much stationary. Any metric you come up with is invariant under translation. It stays the same everywhere. And we could get you to zoom in one more time. And with that, with that class right there, or which is right there, you'd find that in fact, it's no longer stationary. Okay, so I hope this visual example is helping you with the concept of stationarity, realizing that it is a decision that depends on the metric, depends on the scale too. And as we moved across scales from the large scale image of the brick wall to the smaller, to the smaller and even to the sub brick size, that we could see that we were definitely going between stationary, non-stationary, stationary and non-stationary again. The scale matters. And when I say scale, I mean scale of observation and scale of the specific process that you're using. In other words, what's the question you have for the model? Okay, so comments on stationarity. Well, if it bothers you because it seems subjective, I've got bad, bad news for you. You can't avoid it. You cannot avoid a decision stationarity. If you, if you don't make a decision stationarity, you're stuck in the hole. You're stuck with the data. You can't move beyond the data. Conversely, assuming a broad stationarity assumption, just saying, okay, Perch said I can't avoid it, I'm going to go ahead and just say everything's stationary, that would be a very poor choice indeed. You would have a very low accuracy model and you would be locally biased for sure. Geomodeling stationarity is a decision over what region to pull the data, that's the import license, and over what region to use the resulting statistic for the purpose of prediction, that's the export license. Non-stationary trends. Now, if anyone's sitting here and they're thinking, well, there's never stationarity, I'd agree with you. I like where you're going with that because clearly non-stationary trends may be mapped and are mapped. In fact, probably 95% of reservoir models I worked on around the world or reviewed had some type of trend model built into it. And the remaining stationary residual can be modeled statistically with data analytics, use stochastic uncertainty models, and we can go ahead and treat that as uncertain. Good geologic mapping and data integration are always essential, and it is the basic framework to anything we do in the subsurface. 
Okay, let's talk about quantifying spatial continuity, and that will lead us into the interactive section. I apologize. Um, when we do a normal course, I always try to break up lectures, maybe half an hour, jump into an exercise. I try not to talk too much, but there's so much good stuff to talk about right now, and there's some introductions. Given the importance of spatial continuity and the stationarity decision, now let's calculate spatial continuity. We're prepared to do that. Now, the primary statistic used to quantify spatial continuity is the varigram. Now, you would be correct and accurate if you said, well, there's other measures, and I would agree wholeheartedly with you if you were talking about training images, or even some of my students have been working on machine learning-based spatial continuity models that are very, very powerful. But let's go through the varigram. We got to start somewhere. It is a very simple thing. It's just a function of difference over distance. This is a measure of variance or difference, and this is a model of distance offset distance, going from zero to a large number. The way to think about it is it's a two-point statistic going from a location in space, and you're looking at the degree of difference as you increase the distance between those two points. Okay, so as I increase the distance, we're seeing the experimental varigram points are rising up, indicating increasing difference with distance. Okay, now the way we're going to calculate it, and this is why I talked about stationarity, is we're going to have to do, if you look at this, one divided by the number of pairs of data I can find for an H offset vector, which is the distance offset, is just going to be this summation multiplied by that is just an average. So we're taking the average of all of the pairs we can identify, and we're taking the values at the tail location and the head location, differencing them, subtracting them, and squaring them. So this is just simply an average squared difference between values at a tail location and a head location. And we'll calculate it since it's an average, and we're assuming stationarity, we're gonna go ahead and scan throughout the data set and look for all pairs of data that have this distance of separation right there, okay? And so we'll define the tail location as being one value within the data set in space and the head location being another one, but we'll take that lag vector H and scan it around looking for all possible pairs so we can calculate the statistic. And we'll do that for one lag, the next lag, the next lag, and we do that for different lag distances, we'll get this experimental plot right here, which is very, very useful to us. Now, let me just further provide some definitions, and then I'm gonna provide, I think, five or six observations to give you more of an intuitive understanding of the varigram so we can be in a position to calculate it together. Now, the varigram is a measure of dissimilarity versus distance. We calculate it as one half the average square difference of the value separated by lag vector. I am repeating myself, don't worry, this is on purpose. The equation is shown right here again, one half the average squared difference. Now, the precise term we use because of the one half term is semi varigram. If you remove the one half, it is the varigram, but it turns out nobody uses that term. Nobody says semi varigram. Everybody in practice just says varigram for this, this equation right here with the one half term included. The reason we do the one half is not a big deal. We simply do it so that this math right here works out. That we can say that the varigram can be related directly to the variance of the data, and this is simply the univariate variance, and the covariance function, which is a measure of similarity. It's the opposite of the varigram. So we tuck the one half in here to make it happen. Now, those of you who are engineers will be excited to know that the one half also results in this calculation being a moment of inertia around the 45 degree line on the HH scatter plot, but now we're just showing off. Like we will get into those details in the class, but it's not important to cover right here. For basic intuition, just know that we're relating the varigram, a measure of dissimilarity over distance, to a covariance function, which is a measure of similarity over distance. And the covariance function, if standardized by the variance, or if the variance is equal to one, will be equal to the correlogram, which is really nice because it's actually literally a measure of the correlation coefficient between locations over an offset in space. So we all, many of us know the regular 
Pearson product moment correlation coefficient from negative one to positive one. It's very commonly used. Now we know that this correlogram can be related, to, is a correlation coefficient over space and can be related to the covariance and the covariance can be related to the varigram. And so we have kind of like six degrees of bacon and we now know, know where we are. It all kind of makes sense now. So let's make some observations about varigrams that will help you gain some intuition so we can move into calculation. The first observation is that as the distance increases, the variability will typically increase. Therefore, the experimental varigrams will rise up, generally monotonically, not perfectly, not guaranteed. They come back down again. There could be noise, but in general, we hope to see that. Now, take your fingers and put them up to the screen on top of this image. Put them close together and move them around the image. And I think what you'll see is that your two fingers, the tail and the head finger, they're describing that lag vector H, and they're seeing a low value and a low value, a high value and a high value as you move around, or a medium value and a medium value. Now, the hot colors are high values, the purple colors are low values, and the greens and yellows are the medium values, and those are all porosity measures right there. And then if you take your fingers and you move them far apart, I hope you can see that you now start to compare low to high, you may even go from medium to medium. You could even go from low to low, in fact. And so all different things start to happen. You're losing correlation with distance, i.e. the varigram values are increasing. So I hope you've demonstrated this to yourself. As you increase the distance, you lose correlation, you gain a degree of dissimilarity. Okay, second observation, we're gonna be greedy. We're not gonna joke around about this. We don't leave the job half done. We're gonna calculate this varigram for a specific lag vector H, in this case, 100 meters in the X direction. We're gonna find every possible pair and we're not gonna rest until we find them all. In other words, we're not just gonna go here and here and here. We're gonna scan every possible 100 meter offset from here to here, from here to here, and we'll keep going across. In an exhaustive data set like this, you will have thousands and thousands, if not tens of thousands of pairs. You'll have many of pairs, right? Now in exhaust, in sparsely sampled data sets, you'll have fewer, but we're still gonna hunt down every possible pair. And we'll put it into this equation and we'll get the average, one half the average square difference between those pairs in order to calculate every single one of those experimental points. We'll then increase it to say 150 and we'll go back to the data set, and repeat, repeat, repeat. It's a good thing we have a computer to do all this work. Okay, we need to plot the sill to know the degree of correlation. You remember I said that the varigram is going to be related to the varigram to the sill or the variance is going to be related to the covariance or degree of dissimilarity. And in the case that we have standardized variables with variance equal to one, we're gonna find that we can relate it directly like this, that the correlogram is going to be equal to the sill, the variance of the problem, minus the varigram value. In other words, this distance from the sill, the variance of the data set, to the varigram value is in fact the degree of correlation. And if we plotted up all of the points that were used to calculate the varigram for this distance offset, we would find if this is 0 0.5, this would be 0 0.5, the correlation of those points with each other is 0 0.5. At the sill, we'll find that the correlation is now equal to zero, there is no correlation. So we need to plot that sill line, that constant line, to interpret the varigram points, otherwise I don't know the degree of correlation. And that's what really matters. Now, we could furthermore investigate and we could talk about, well, what happens if the varigram values go above the sill? And what you'll find, that actually indicates you have negative correlation. That should be a negative 0.47, excuse that. But that is a negative correlation in that plot. Now, observation number four, the lag distance at which the varigram reaches the sill is known as the range. And so when we reach the sill, we no longer have correlation and we term that as the range. We use the range as a parameter to build varigram models and to communicate. 
From now on, if your boss comes in your office and asks you what's going on at a distance beyond the range from your previous well, you can tell them you have no information. Now, uh, granted, if you have a trend model or deterministic models and so forth, it's not no information or secondary information. I know that, of course, but with regard to a data-driven geostatistical approach only, you have no correlation. Observation number five, sometimes there's a discontinuity at very short distances known as the nugget effect. That is caused by discontinuities at very short scales. It, its name actually comes from mining gold nuggets, in which case you would often have a gold nugget naturally occurring at very short distances and a little bit of a segment from a diamond drill core sample and the next, next segment would not have the gold nugget and the result would be you'd see high degree of variability at very short distances we would say at distances below the minimum data spacing and this is manifest by an offset in the experimental varigram points on the plot right here all right varigram interpretation now that we understand the varigram let's see if we can see with a new lens of the varigram here's three maps with 50 data each one of them same data same distributions but they have different varigram models. Here's one, it's a spherical model. We'll talk more about this later. Exponential and a Gaussian model. Now, what you can do with a varigram, put your hand up to the screen and go ahead and just block everything in the long distances. Just look at this first bin right here. Notice that they all have very different varigrams at very short scales. Now look at the maps. Sit back, the geophysicist will be very good at this. You already look in scales. You know how to kind of look from an angle. You know how to kind of squint to kind of filter out information. You're good at this. Go ahead and look at those maps and observe the differences in the very short distances or sh observe the differences in the correlation over very short distances. And if you do that, you'll see the exponential model that rises very quickly, high degree of variability at short distances looks noisy. The spherical, a little bit so. The Gaussian model, mm -mm, looks very smooth and continuous. Now, go ahead and look at the long distances. Put your hand back up there, block the short up to this line right here, and compare those varigram models to each other. Now, if you look really carefully, I think you can agree the varigram models converge when we get to a distance very close to the range. They become very similar to each other now. And now this is the geophysicist turn. S sit back from the screen, kind of squint a little bit and look at those images and just filter out the noise and look at the long range, the long distance structure. You see the high, 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 low, low, kind of these general transitions, the size of the lows and the highs they are actually not that dissimilar from each other. They are getting to be more similar. In fact, now you're starting to see spatial frequencies over different distances. You're observing the power of the varigram to observe over these different distances. And there's much more we could talk about. Okay, now how do you calculate a varigram? It turns out the data are never gonna be regularly spaced. In fact, if you had that example, you said, I wanna calculate a varigram for the X direction or the East direction in my data set at exactly 090.000 azimuth, you would find that none of your data are exactly on that direction. And if you said for 100 meters, you'd find that none of your data are 100.000 meters from each other. And so you have to decide on some type of tolerance. And so it makes sense. We can go ahead and select a unit lag distance where we'll say, okay, we're gonna pick a unit lag distance that we're gonna try to observe different pairs at, and we're gonna do a distance tolerance. We're gonna say an azimuth and an azimuth tolerance, and we're gonna do a bandwidth to limit the directionality to a specific direction to really get anisotropy in the model. We're gonna do this and do it over a major and minor direction. Okay, so what does that look like? First, we're gonna look at the data set and we're gonna look at the minimum data spacing. It makes no sense to calculate varigrams at any distance shorter because you'll have no pairs. And we'll look for a nominal minimal data spacing. We don't wanna to go too small where we have too few pairs either. And so we'll set a lag distance. So in a direction, we have a lag distance maybe 100 meters, 200 meters. So the fundamental unit lag distance is 100 meters. This is the second lag, the third lag, the fourth lag, and so forth. 
will have a direction. If you look at this data set, it actually makes sense to go in the 045 azimuth direction because I hope you can see there's something special going on. The geoscientist, and I saw we had a high proportion of you, I hope you're noticing that there's a paleo flow direction clearly in this data set. Okay, so we got our lag distance. Now, we said things won't be exactly 100 meters apart or whatever our unit lag distance is, so we will have a lag tolerance. So this was our second lag, we'll have plus or minus a lag tolerance, third lag, plus or minus a lag tolerance, and by selecting by default one half the lag distance, we don't leave any data out. This bin right here will touch against this bin right here and no data will fall through a crack. Now you could use a lower lag tolerance, but you'll lose some data, you'll increase the noise. You could use a larger lag tolerance, your bins would overlap with each other, it would smooth the results, and sometimes we may want to do that if the results are too noisy. Now we have an azimuth tolerance, because once again, what's the chance of data being exactly on the 090.000 azimuth? It would never happen. And so we'll put a tolerance. And so we could use a default commonly around 22.5 or 20 degrees is pretty common for directional varigrams. And so we do it like this. We now have a tolerance, an angle of 22.5 degrees away from the initial vector, this lag vector. And then what we can do is we can say we have these shapes now for individual lag bins because we have the tolerance and distance and an azimuth making these shapes right here. Now, if you lower the azimuth tolerance, you'll have more directionality or more sensitivity to the direction, but your result will be noisier, you'll have fewer data. If you use a larger azimuth tolerance, you'll become more isotropic, the result will be smoother, and sometimes we do that in noisy, noisy data. And if you go to a full 90 degrees of azimuth tolerance, you're now isotropic. You are not considering directionality. You're taking all possible data pairs for all directions within the lag distance plus or minus the lag distance tolerance. This shape here becomes really like a donut. It's a donut shape at that point. Sorry, I think I missed lunch today. Bandwidth is for the case where we want to limit. You see with this example, we let the size of those shapes continually increase. The further we go out, the, the longer the lag distance, the further we're gonna go away from that vector. Well, you might say if I have stratigraphic units and this varigram is in fact in a cross section, this is a vertical coordinate, I don't wanna go into adjacent stratigraphic units, I could say use a bandwidth. A bandwidth is a maximum distance I will go away from the vector, and so it restricts the search neighborhood to look like that. Now, if you're gonna use a isotropic varigram with a 90 degree azimuth tolerance, use a very large bandwidth or you end up with an artifact. It'll just be an artifact of which direction you happen to pick and we'll show that example. Okay, let's go ahead and do some interactive varigram calculation right now. Now, in the course, we would spend more time going through code, talking about code. The course doesn't necessarily teach code for the sake of coding, but teaches code from the perspective of building workflows and understanding concepts. And so what we have right here is a varigram calculation interactive tool. Now, anybody who follows me on Twitter or looks at my GitHub account will notice I make a lot of these types of tools. If anybody's a Jeeper, I recently made one that can help you fit Jeeps to your uh, Jeep tires and wheels. Um, it'll actually show the section from behind and the side view of your Jeep as you change the lift and change your wheels and tire specs. So in case anyone's interested in that. But this is all part of interactive display to understand models and to learn concepts. Not necessarily Jeep tires all the time, but something technical like this. Now, Jupyter, I won't go into details now explaining a Jupyter notebook if you haven't ever used one before, but let me just say it's a wonderful way to build interactive workflows, to build well-documented workflows, to prototype, oh, I can't help myself. Let me make a couple of comments right here. The comment I'll make is that with Jupyter, what you can do is you can take and build blocks. And the blocks can have a sequence, well, a sequence of blocks 
they can have documentation right here. I have hyperlinks, all kinds of formatting, equations. This is stuff we just talked about. If you double click it, this is exactly what I wrote in what's known as Markdown. Anyone's used LaTeX, it's kind of a watered down version of LaTeX. And we can go ahead and run the block and we can see the compiled version has my nicely formatted, uh, the observations, everything is there. Okay, then what we can do is we can go down here, we can import a package. Now I import Geostat Pi, it's the package I wrote for spatial data analytics to support education. My students use it, other schools use it. Uh, it's used a variety of places, it's publicly available, completely open source for anyone to use. All you have to do is you can open up a Jupyter Notebook and type this command and start using Geostat Pi. Now you'd have to install Geostat Pi first, not a big deal, super easy to do. You can run that block of code and install it. Now the world of brilliance in Python is this, is that I can run this block of code and immediately import NumPy to deal with arrays of data and all kinds of array math, Pandas, which Dr. Foster is gonna be teaching in that next uh, webinar coming up and he does an excellent job coming, covering this. Pandas is all for data frames. How do we deal with tabular data like our well data it would be tabular data. NumPy would be exhaustive data, mesh data like uh, seismic images and so forth would be that. And Matplotlib for just being able to build really great visualizations. And all of these IPy widgets are so we can do interactive workflows. I couldn't help myself, I, had, I knew I had time for it. So I threw in a little explanation around Jupyter Notebook. If you have not downloaded and installed Anaconda, Anaconda 3. Point something. I recommend you do that. And you can get Jupyter, you'll get all these fundamental packages already. You can install my Geostat Pi too, that'd be fine. You can get that very easily. And what's very cool is what I'm finding is that in many companies I'm going to now, I'm seeing Anaconda is actually starting to be accepted. It's starting to be made available um, within their internal systems even in some cases. So very, very nice. Okay, so I'll skip all that. I'll just show you the data set we're working with is a porosity data set right here. I think it's the same data set I showed in the course notes, so it should not be a surprise. I believe it's the same one. We have permeability and we also have the relationship between the two. We have Shaley rock, we have sand facies, so a binary facies assignment right here. Okay, so let's go ahead and do some interactivity. I can run this code down below and I'll create an interactive varigram using the Geostat Pi package. Okay, so what are we gonna do? First of all, if you looked at the data set, it looked like our minimum data spacing was clearly less than 200 meters. So the first thing we could do is we could drop the unit lag distance. Now you look at that, when we do that, what we do is we now have experimental varigrams at 20 meters, 40 meters, 60 meters, 80 meters, and so forth, all the way up to a thousand meters. We're going all the way to the extent of the data set to look for pairs. Now what we could do, is we could actually start looking at the lag tolerance. We could say, well, let's say we want to increase the lag tolerance and see what that would do. Well, if we increase the lag tolerance, watch this. The points are getting bigger because we're starting to have more pairs at every single location. The points are scaled by number of pairs. It tells you about the reliability of the points. But do you see what happens? That point, that line is starting to smooth out. It's smoothing out and it's becoming more and more level. We're losing information. So the whole choice of lag tolerance is very similar to the choice of the size of your bins in a histogram. If you use too big of a bin, you're gonna smooth out all the information. If you use too small of a bin, you get noisier results. Okay, let's go ahead and see that. I can prove that to you. We can drop the lag tolerance down to just 10 degrees plus or minus 10 degrees and the result is the points got very small because we have very few pairs we're being quite restrictive lag distance tolerance of only 20 meters and the azimuth tolerance is only 10 degrees and the result is we have a lot less data available and look at the varigram do you see how the experimental varigram is becoming very noisy now let's go ahead and take the azimuth tolerance back up to 90 degrees. Let me prove to you that this is an isotropic varigram. The directionality, the azimuth, is currently 0, 4, 0, 40 degree azimuth, 0 degree in the y direction or 0, 0, 0, 0, 9, 0 in the x direction. It's going clockwise. Okay, so look what happens if I change the directionality. 
the only thing that changes is the label on the plot because it's an isotropic varigram. And azimuth tolerance of 90 degrees, in fact, will result in a varigram, experimental varigram, that's insensitive to directionality. Okay, that was pretty cool. Let's go ahead and drop the azimuth tolerance down and let's talk about directionality. Because when we look at the data set, remember what I mentioned, it looked channelized and they look like they're in the zero, four, five direction. I'm gonna drop the azimuth down to zero degrees and I'm gonna slowly scan through and I want you to note what happens as we transition from zero to zero, four, five to zero, nine, zero and on. Zero, zero, five. 010, 015. We're now at 030, 035, 040, 045. Do you see how the degree of dissimilarity has dropped? The varigram range has significantly increased. The, the length scale at which we can see spatial continuity. In fact, we're off the chart now. All right. Susan, am I, am time I out to take of time? a few questions. It's it's time to take a few questions from the audience. We're we're starting to get the questions, and I want to make sure we don't run out of time. So one of the first questions we said is, how do we handle the edge of the survey during sampling? Yeah, very good question. And Susan, I apologize. I just realized my sound was off. Were there other questions that I miss anything? Okay, no, I'm no, no. Go. I'm I'm reading them from the chat. The listeners are typing them in and sending them. Excellent. So this is a very good comment and you've really caught me on something. I think we might have an expert here in the audience with us, Susan. So basically what's happening here is we recognize the fact that as you go to longer and longer distance offsets with the lags, that you'll reach a point, if you take your two fingers and you make them about 900 meters apart and put them on that plot, I hope you can see that you would only be comparing the edge data with each other. You would miss all of the samples in the middle. And so the rule of thumb in varigram calculation, virography, would be you should not really go past one half the extent of the data set or you have edge effects. And so I think that's exactly what you're picking up on down here is when we take this and we change the azimuth here, we see the varigram up to about 500 meters, probably pretty reliable. Past 500 meters, it starts to get more noisy, starts to cycle. This is probably instability due to the fact that we're losing pairs and we're only sampling the edges. We're seeing an edge artifact. Thank you for that question. Next question, are there prerequisites for your course like uh, background with coding or statistics? Yep, and this is an excellent question, Susan. In fact, I pride myself in the fact that this class we build from zero. You could come in with basically no understanding of statistics or coding, nor geostatistic, nor machine learning, and we will make everything accessible to you. We will step through everything. We will give you a chance to play with machines, play with data analytics, gain experience from it. But we do build from zero, fundamental concepts and axioms up. Excellent. So while we're waiting to see if there's any more questions from our audience, I'll remind everyone that later today you're going to receive a link to a recording of today's webinar. We'll give you an evaluation form for Dr. Perch. Make sure to give him high marks. And a link to register for his class, Introduction to Subsurface Machine Learning with Python, that's often offered live in four half days, July 21st through 24th, 8 to noon, Houston time. And uh, it, it looks like we are getting questions about the details of your class and, and uh, nothing specific. Oh, here's a question. Are you going to use seismic and logs in your course? Good question. We do demonstrate approaches that use well logs. We do demonstrate approaches that use seismic specifically as secondary information in order to build predictive and inferential models. We also show other examples where we use specific like acoustic logs that are uh, available at well locations and so forth. So we work with a wide variety of different features and demonstrate how data analytics and machine learning may be applied. So what is the typical background of most of the people who attend your course? Are they geostaticians or are they geologists, engineers? I have never had, I don't think I've actually had a geostatician. We're kind of a rare breed. <laughs> and so, so in fact, you know what's interesting? It's been a very nice split 
between geoscientists and engineers. But I'll tell you what, every once in a while, I have a Bayesian probability expert or something like that, and I love it because it, it causes kind of this rich dialogue and discussion. But I have, but there's never been an ex expectation that we would have somebody as an expert already in data analytics, data science, or a probability and so forth. Okay, I'm getting a few challenges from the audience and perhaps they're preparing to make a case to management to attend your course. But they're saying, why should machine learning work add value in the geoscience this time if it did not do so in the past? Well, and I would agree with you. There has been multiple waves of machine learning. I, I love it. I have gone into our, into our field, met with many people, many companies, and they said, listen, I was doing some of this stuff back in the 90s, earlier, right? And I do respect our experience. My perspective is this, is this new wave in machine learning and data analytics, first of all, is being driven by brand new algorithms or brand new data sets and brand new computational resources. Those are kind of the advantages we have today. Now I'll let you in on a little secret. And that is, I think a lot of what we're doing here is learning how to do be, work better with our data. Fundamental data analytics, Fundamental inferential approaches to learn from our data, I think are just as important as kind of the really kind of flashy machine learning methodologies. In fact, in my class, uh, people, you might be disappointed if you, I actually spend <laughs> the first three days covering fundamental prerequisites, spatial concepts, inferential machine learning. It's not till the last day we get into predictive machine learning and we actually focus on some of the more simpler, intuitive, interpretable approaches. And so I do argue yeah. that in many cases, it's just a new set of tools that we can use. So here's a, another challenge. I can do everything you've shown today in Petrel or in Excel. Why should I learn Python? I love that. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm right there with you. I use GoCAD, Petrel, Excel, and so forth. I, I'm, I'm right there with you. What we were doing today was we were bridging. We were taking a group that we knew would not have a lot of experience in this area, geoscientists and engineers, and we want to dive into a prerequisite, something we could bite off and work on together and show kind of a, an example of the lecture notes, an example of the type of interactivity, something that you would be aware of and familiar with. We could have just jumped into an artificial neural net, but I feel like we wouldn't have bridged. And so I'm not, I'm not concerned by this. You, yes, you could do this in, Patrol. I would suggest that as we move forward into other types of data analytics and machine learning, you'll find very quickly that's no longer the case. Another question about being able to predict failures for ESP pump data after using your course. Is that a good application? Yeah, and I, I really like that example. In fact, one of my PhD students recently did a joint project with BP. We were looking at failures in pipe junctions due to thermal cycling. And what was really, really cool about this was that we worked with a physics-based data set and we came up with a specific machine that worked quite well. It was a support vector machine, if anyone's ever heard of it. It works very well when the data is noisy, there's overlaps, but there's actually a nice, clean, complicated geometric shape. It does a great job of capturing that. That was a really nice example of a classification model that gave us the pro that we could use for probability prediction in the future of for failures. Yes. And I think there'd be tons of different tools we can look at that would be able to address that problem. One last question. Is your GitHub available for everyone? Yeah, so good question. So remember, I, I made the statement right off the bat that I am, as a professor, I'm very much committed to supporting professional development. And if you look at my GitHub right now, I'm Geostats guy on GitHub, check it out. I have tons of examples in Python, R, even Excel. I taught a full course in a company that said, we don't wanna do Python. We did the whole thing in Excel, it was a lot of fun. And so what I'm saying is that's all available. Now, the specific course content that we use within this training and so forth, we have a learning management system which is available to attendees of the courses. But I do put a lot of content out. Check out my YouTube channel too. I've got all my courses recorded. Great. Well, I think we've run out of time today. We're getting lots of um, appreciative comments from, from the audience. And uh, as I said, everyone will receive a link to today's uh, a recording of the webinar, be sure and share it with your colleagues and uh, consider registering for the class that Dr. Perch will be teaching 
July 21st through 24th, half days, virtually, live online, introduction to subsurface machine learning with Python. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you.